Greetings, Medical Wildcats. I'm Joseph Guggenheim. I'm a 1972 alumnus of the medical school. And today I'm doing a, uh, the final uh, uh, part of my two-part series on uh, the Great Chicago Fire, which uh, we're now commemorating the 150th anniversary. Uh, it occurred in October, 1871. The first part was on the fire and the, and the destruction it caused. And uh, today's presentation will be on the rebuilding of Chicago. Instead of giving a lecture, uh, I'm going to do something a little different. Uh, here are six sentences about uh, uh, the uh, Chicago fire. Uh, look them over and decide which ones are true and which ones are false. Uh, I must admit that uh, until I became a serious student of Chicago history, uh, when I retired, I probably would have failed this test. So let's get started on the first one. The Great Fire of 1871 was started by Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicking over a kerosene lamp. We covered this uh, pretty much uh, last time. Now, this was a story that uh, uh, has persisted for years, uh, probably made up by a reporter for one of the Chicago. Greetings, medical wildcats. I'm Joseph Guggenheim. I'm a 1972 alumnus of the medical school. And today I'm doing a, uh, the final uh, uh, part of my two-part series on uh, the Great Chicago Fire, which uh, we're now commemorating the 150th anniversary. Uh, it occurred in October. 1871. The first part was on the fire and the, and the destruction it caused, and uh, today's presentation will be on the rebuilding of Chicago. Instead of giving a lecture, uh, I'm going to do something a little different. Uh, here are six sentences about uh, uh, the uh, Chicago fire. Uh, look them over and decide which ones are true and which ones are false. Uh, I must admit that uh, until I became a serious student of Chicago history, uh, when I retired, I probably would have failed this test. So let's get started on the first one. The Great Fire of 1871 was started by Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicking over a kerosene lamp. We covered this uh, pretty much uh, last time. Now, this was a story that uh, uh, has persisted for years, uh, probably made up by a reporter for one of the Chicago newspapers. Um, Catherine O'Leary was a scapegoat. Uh, she was uh, white, female. Uh, an immigrant, Irish, and poor. Uh, she was probably in her late 30s, but uh, the newspaper stories uh, made her sound like she was a bent over uh, elderly woman uh, who was a, uh, a welfare cheat. An inquiry after the fire the following month, November 1871, absolved her from, uh, absolved her of blame for the starting the fire. And the O'Leary's and the cow were exonerated by the Chicago City Council in 1997. The fire was probably started by sparks from a nearby chimney. Okay, the second sentence, the devastating fire wiped out Chicago, including all major businesses and buildings. This is also false. The fire did uh, wipe out 18,600 buildings, mostly north of the river. It destroyed an area uh, measuring approximately three quarters of a mile wide and four miles long, a third of the valuation of the city. A third of the population was left homeless. 120 miles of sidewalks and 73 miles of street uh, were burned. Uh, but uh, only 150 uh, bodies were ever found from the uh, fire. The um, estimated uh, uh, morbidity was, uh, mortality was probably higher than this. Uh, there were obviously some people that were burned beyond recognition and some that drowned in Lake Michigan, but uh, 150 is too many, but it, was, uh, it could have been much worse. But many of Chicago's resources were left unaffected, including the Union Stockyards, which opened in 1865, and the meat processing plants in the area. Two thirds of the grain elevators on the west side remained intact. Most of the wharfs, lumber yards, rolling mills and machine shops uh, were unaffected. Thousands of miles of railroad track and 20 miles of lakeshore docking were unaffected. And perhaps most of all Chicago's unique geographical position being at the hub of the uh, railroads from the west, the Mississippi River from the south and the Great Lakes uh, uh, north and uh, from the east uh, were a, a, a part of Chicago's uh, uh, amazing geography. And the indomitable spirit of the citizens also uh, could not be destroyed by the fire. There were several buildings in the path of the fire that uh, managed to survive. Uh, 
perhaps best known is the water tower, which you can see in the background of this building. Uh, the water tower had a cupola on the top uh, at the time, uh, but uh, just the same building that exists now on Michigan Avenue. The, uh, the Ogden Mansion, which is now the site of the Newberry Library at the corner of North Dearborn and West Walton, was also saved. Uh, the staff and uh, guests at the uh, building uh, soaked down uh, uh, blankets and sheets, towels, and spread them over the building to, to uh, try to save it. And uh, luckily, it was saved. It is at the uh, north. It was at the north end of uh, Washington Square Park, which is still in existence, and the site is now the Dearborn Library. Marlon Ogden was the uh, brother of Chicago's first mayor. Two churches were uh, remained intact. Uh, St. Michael Church in Lincoln Park, which was the tallest building in Chicago from 1869 until 1885. And the St. James Cathedral in the River North, uh, which is now the uh, cathedral for the Episcopal Diocese. Uh, the black uh, area on the uh, uh, buildings uh, were probably uh, uh, due to uh, air pollution, uh, uh, perhaps uh, some from the fire, but mostly air pollution. Another building which survived was the uh, Lint Block, which was at the northwest intersection of Water Street, which is now North Wacker Drive and Randolph. Uh, this was the building uh, for the medical department of Lint University from 1859 to 1863. The medical department of Lint University uh, was the original predecessor of our medical school. The building was named for Sylvester Lint, who was in the lumber business. Lint owned a lumber yard on the site uh, where he built the Lint block in the 1850s. He uh, docked several boats in this area, which he used for shipping lumber uh, from uh, north on uh, Lake Michigan. But he also used his boats uh, to run the part of the Underground Railroad to free slaves uh, in the South. And then after they were freed, uh, to offer them employment. Uh, the medical department, as I said, occupied this building from 1859 when the medical department was founded uh, by a group of disgruntled faculty members at Rush who wanted to uh, reform medical education in the United States until 1863, when Lent University started having financial problems during the Civil War. In 1871, Sylvester Lent sold the buildings to Z.H. Hall Wholesale Grocers just before the fire. And the building survived because uh, uh, perhaps luck, but also because Zebulon Hall, his sons and employees hauled buckets of water from the adjacent Chicago River and soaked the building during the fire. And for three days after the fire, Zebulon Hall and his family provided refuge, giving away groceries to the destitute and homeless. The building survived several other fires, 1896, 1899, and 1955. It was considered the old, oldest building in the loop when it was demolished in 1963. Some feel that this building, instead of the uh, uh, water tower or uh, the Hancock Center, which is now 875 North Michigan, uh, or even the Bean, should be considered the symbol of Chicago because of its history as, a, uh, as the center for uh, part of the Underground Railroad to uh, free the slaves. Uh, the original building for one of the finest medical schools in the country um, and uh, a site of uh, uh, refuge and uh, philanthropy for those affected by the fire. The third sentence, donations and new business investments poured in from all over the world. This is true. William Bross, who was co-owner of the uh, Chicago Tribune, uh, took a train uh, eastward uh, to Buffalo, New York on October 11th and New York City on October 12th. And his famous quote is, go to Chicago now, young men hurry there, old men send your sons, women send your husbands, you will never again have such a chance to make money. Braver and truer, nobler and better men do not live than the leading, uh, men, leading businessmen of Chicago. He went on to say that by 1900, uh, the new Chicago will boast a million uh, uh, population. Uh, and uh, he said, she finished by saying she has only to wait a few short years for the sure development of her manifest destiny. After the fire, within 48 hours, uh, 12 of the 29 banks in the Chicago business area, which had been burned, 
uh, had been reestablished in temporary quarters. Before the week was out, banks were paying depositors 15%. And within a week, all were prepared to make unconditional payments. Henry Greenbaum, a pioneer banker in the area, was trying to encourage investment banking uh, from uh, Europe and uh, from the uh, Northeast Coast, uh, in, uh, encouraging bankers to invest in the opportunities in Chicago, saying that the uh, recent misfortune was only temporary. Donations also came in uh, for two other reasons. Uh, Chicago was the fastest growing city in the world. It was uh, um, admired by many as the cornucopia of modern civilization. Uh, and it was a uh, emerging as a major manufacturing and mercantile center. Another reason was that uh, with the advent of the telegraph system, uh, people all over the world had in almost instantaneous access to the news, uh, as you can see in this picture of uh, a boy selling newspapers. And uh, this kept uh, uh, people from all over the uh, US and the world interested in what was going on in Chicago. On the left, you can see a list of uh, uh, some of the donations that were pouring in. Evanston sent food and, and supplies to the refugees who had tried to escape to the north uh, from the fire and were camping in Lincoln Park. The picture on the right uh, was from uh, the magazine Harper's Weekly, published only a few weeks after the fire, uh, showing how generous uh, many of the donors had been to Chicago. Edward Armitage, a British painter, painted this mural for City Hall. In it, you can see uh, two women trying to give aid to the female figure in the center, uh, which is representative of Chicago. On the left, you see a lion, and on the right, you see an eagle. The lion symbolized Great Britain, and the eagle symbolized the United States. Half of the foreign aid uh, for the, the Chicago victims uh, came from Great Britain. Chicago opened its first uh, public library in January 1873. Public libraries were rare at the time. Uh, perhaps the Boston Public Library was the first large one. Most libraries uh, at that time were private. The London author A.H. Burgess uh, wanted to contribute uh, a uh, public library to Chicago as a token of true brotherly kindness forever. The library uh, was built in an empty water tank measuring 60 feet in diameter and 30 feet high. It was built behind the newly built city hall at the corner of Adams and LaSalle, the round structure with the flag on the top. But the building had its problems. It was hot in the summer and cold in the winter. There were 13,000 books in this public library um, donated from Great Britain, Germany, and the United States. Uh, it's estimated that perhaps 8,000 of these books came from Great Britain alone. The Chicago Relief and AIDS Society was appointed by Mayor Roswell Mason uh, to distribute uh, uh, relief uh, to victims of the fire. And in the picture at the upper right, uh, you can see the organization handing out clothing. The organization raised over $5 million to provide food, clothing, water, and fuel to the victims of the fire. They vaccinated 60,000 people against smallpox and built temporary barracks. The lower picture shows some of these barracks in Washington Square Park, uh, which is uh, adjacent to the current Newberry Library, uh, just uh, northwest of the medical school campus. The picture uh, showed uh, the barracks in the winter with snow on the ground and children playing in the snow. The Chicago Relief and Aid Society was established in 1851 by prominent citizens. Most, if not all of them were uh, male, white, affluent, uh, and, uh, and Protestant. Uh, one of the uh, members was uh, Nathaniel Fairbank, for whom Fairbank's Court uh, Street is named, the street that runs through the medical school campus. Uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, the street is named after uh, the pre former president of the Board of Trustees of the University of Chicago, yet it runs through the Northwestern campus. For some reason, Fairbank dropped the S at the end of his name, although his family members continued to spell their name Fairbanks. The society believed in scientific charity, helping only uh, whom they considered the worthy poor, and they discriminated against immigrant workers. 
They were uh, going to help only those brought to a state of want through no fault of their own. Uh, when the society was stopped, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, society retained uh, over $600,000 in undispersed funds. But fire could not stop baseball. The uh, uh, Chicago uh, baseball team, the White Stockings, which uh, later became the Cubs, not the White Sox, uh, finished strong in the 1871 season. In their final game, they played the Philadelphia Athletics for the championship of the National Association of Professional Baseball Players at the end of October, 1871, the same month as the fire. Uh, the fire had uh, destroyed all the uniforms for the White Stockings, but other pro teams in the league uh, uh, loaned them uh, uniforms and no two players uh, matched, as you can see in this picture. Uh, the highlighted area of the picture says, they appeared in their first match after the great Chicago fire in which their uniforms were destroyed. Uh, this game was the equivalent of our current uh, uh, World Series and the White Stockings lost, unfortunately, four to one. The only run was scored in the bottom of the ninth on a fielder's choice. In the fourth sentence, the new replacement buildings were constructed in strict compliance of the city's new building code. This is also false. Reconstruction started immediately. Some of the rubble was still hot when the reconstruction began. A week after the fire, there were over 5,000 temporary structures, mostly wooden cottages, which resembled the pre-fire buildings. Uh, if you wanna see what the uh, pre-fire Chicago looked like, uh, you only need to go as far as Old Town because many of the buildings there uh, resemble the pre-fire buildings. Frederick Law Olmsted uh, uh, thought that the quality of buildings had resulted in a greater damage and death. Joseph Mandill, who was co-owner of the uh, Chicago Tribune uh, and uh, uh, became the editor in 1874, was elected mayor in November 1871, a month after the fire, on the fireproof ticket. Uh, Medill, like uh, many members of the Relief and Aid Society, was uh, Caucasian, Protestant, affluent, and he was also anti-immigrant, especially anti-Irish. Uh, it's unknown if the election was uh, really honest because 60% of Chicago electorate was uh, made up of uh, uh, the working class, and about half of Chicago uh, was either uh, uh, immigrants or first generation, but uh, and the the voting records uh, had been destroyed in the fire. So I'm not saying it was a dishonest election, but uh, it's a little suspicious. Uh, but Medill did enact ordinances for stricter building codes, improvements in the water supply and a larger fire department and limits on wooden construction. So hopefully this would not happen again. He warned residents that another disastrous fire uh, could occur if the ordinances were not followed, but they were uh, defied and rarely enforced because people needed to build uh, homes and other buildings. The, on the picture on the right is taken from the water tower looking north, and you can see uh, the uh, uh, edge of Lake Michigan in this picture in the upper right corner. The new buildings uh, by law were supposed to be built with fireproof materials, brick, stone, marble, limestone and terracotta. But many people, especially the workers, could not afford to build with these materials and they had to ignore the new building laws. They thought that the building code discriminated against the poor, but the city council passed laws forbidding wooden structures within the city limits anyway, despite the protests. Protesters broke into a city council meeting in 1872 to protest the, what they thought were discriminatory restrictions against those who could only afford wood. Medill in, uh, increased his powers uh, and issued a ban on Sunday drinking. This infuriated uh, many uh, people, especially the Germans and Irish, because they socialized by getting together for a drink on Sunday afternoons. So they thought this was discriminating against them. Uh, Chicago re uh, obtained some relief uh, for rebuilding from the Illinois and federal governments. But the stress of the mayor's job affected Joseph Medill uh, so he turned the job over to Lester Bond with three and a half months left on his term and took a convalescing trip to Europe. Number five, the burnt out buildings were replaced by Chicago skyscrapers. 
this is also false. Uh, the buildings were replaced by skyscrapers, but not uh, until another 10 or 15 years. Uh, the Chicago Architecture Center says, the myth is often told that the fire cleared the city, wiping the slate clean so tall new skyscrapers could be designed and built. But in reality, uh, the new construction looked very similar to what was built before the fire. Business owners quickly rebuilt what they knew. So most of the rebuilt buildings were only four to five stories high, like the uh, uh, pre-fire buildings. The taller buildings require talented architects, which Chicago obtained, uh, but not immediately. Improvements in foundations were also necessary to build bigger buildings because the area around the business district was a uh, uh, soft, swampy soil. Safe elevators uh, uh, had to be built. And uh, uh, these were uh, built by the Otis Elevator Company uh, after its founder uh, began uh, uh, building them in 1853. And improvements in firefighting would were also necessary for taller buildings. The rubble had to be cleared away, but it was used as landfill. Uh, some of it was uh, used to enlarge Grant Park into the lake, to, uh, building it toward the east. Uh, Streeterville uh, was also largely uh, built on uh, rubble from the fire. And our medical school is largely built on uh, uh, this rubble. Uh, the techniques had to be uh, developed for foundations uh, to, uh, for larger buildings. Lighter steel replaced iron for the uh, skeleton of the building. Rebuilding was also delayed by the financial panic of 1873 and another fire in 1874. So it would be another 10 or 15 years before eight to 10 story skyscrapers would replace the first post-fire buildings. So the question arises, would Chicago have developed skyscrapers without uh, the fire? And the answer is, is most likely yes, uh, because the uh, business district, uh, both south and north of the main branch of the river, uh, uh, these areas were bounded by, on three sides by uh, the river and its uh, north and south branch and by Lake Michigan. So space was at a premium and the only place to go was up. So yes, skyscrapers probably would have uh, come, uh, although uh, we don't know when. The home insurance building, uh, which was built in 1884, was considered Chicago's first skyscraper at 10 stories. It was preceded by the Equitable Life Assurance Building in New York City, which was 10 stories, and was one of the first buildings to have the electric Otis elevators. And the sixth uh, statement, Chicago would never again have another major fire. Unfortunately, this is also false. Chicago had another major fire in, eight, in the summer of 1874, less than three years after the 1871 fire. The summer again had been hot and dry. On July 10th, the fire broke out uh, in the South Division, the area south of the uh, main branch of the river near the intersection of Clark and uh, 12th Street, 12th Road, uh, which is now Roosevelt. This was a half mile from where the great fire in 1871 occurred. Like the 1871 fire, the fire advanced north and east uh, toward Michigan Avenue, consuming 47 acres. It destroyed 18, uh, 812 buildings, and this compares to over 18,000 buildings in the Great Fire. 619 of these buildings were wooden. I show these two maps because the one on the left, the old map, uh, shows uh, the area of the second fire. The second fire is uh, uh, the area uh, with the purple arrow. You can see part of it overlaps with the 1871 fire. But the reason I put in this old uh, map, which doesn't show anything north of the main branch of the river is to show how narrow Grant Park was at the time uh, before the rubble enlarged it. It also shows the, uh, the vertical line that was the Illinois Central Railroad, uh, which was right at the edge of uh, Lake Michigan. The colored map on the right, again, shows the uh, area of the 1874 fire uh, at the purple arrow, and you can see how it also overlapped the uh, 1871 fire, but it burned a much smaller area. The fire of 1874 again was uh, uh, blamed on an immigrant, just like 1871, but this time Jewish. Uh, it was later attributed to arson. 
The victims of the, this fire were largely African American and Jewish. Uh, this fire justified those who were calling for stricter building regulations and insurers threatened to withdraw from the Chicago market after these two disasters, uh, also encouraging the uh, enforcement of the building code. The fire marshal uh, uh, was accused of drunkenness and having an affair. Uh, he was the fire marshal during the 71, 1871 fire and the 1874, uh, so he was replaced. Another disastrous fire occurred in uh, December 1903 at the Ir Iroquois Theater. This theater had been open only a week when the fire occurred. It was allegedly fireproof despite uh, a large amount of wooden trim. Sparks from a spotlight set the curtain on fire. Uh, it was a disaster because exits were poorly marked, poorly designed, and there was only one entrance. The balcony doors had been locked uh, to prevent patrons from uh, moving to better seats on the uh, first floor during intermission. Out of an audience of 1,600, over 600 people uh, were killed uh, uh, because they failed to escape the fire. And this was the worst single building fire in US history. Remember, there were only 150 documented deaths from the 1871 fire. And here in this single uh, fire in a one building, over 600 people were killed. The performance was a holiday matinee in December. And so many audience members were mothers and children. The second most destructive fire in Chicago history occurred in May 1934, Saturday, May 19th. And you can see in this aerial photograph uh, how massive this fire was. It caused $8 million in property damage. Luckily, only one person uh, lost his life. Over 50 were injured, but 400 to 1,000 livestock perished. It also destroyed the home of Big Jim O'Leary. Jim O'Leary was the son of Catherine and Patrick O'Leary, uh, who were the scapegoats for the 1871 fire. He was a gambling boss in uh, uh, Chicago at the time. And uh, uh, his fire was destroyed uh, along with uh, part of the stockyards. Like the 1871 and 74 fire, uh, this uh, fire was preceded by a dry spill. It was attributed to a motorist throwing a lit cigarette into some hay. Luckily, the nearby railroad embankment served as fire stops. Uh, in true Chicago spirit, the stockyards, uh, uh, which were uh, ablaze on Saturday, uh, May 19th, opened for business again on Monday, May 21st. Chicago showed its resiliency at the uh, 1893 World's Fair, the Columbian Exposition. Uh, the Fair was supposed to uh, commemorate the 400th anniversary of the uh, uh, discovery of the New World by Christopher Columbus, but it also uh, celebrated uh, uh, the rebuilding of Chicago, and Chicago was proud to show the world what they had done. You can see in this poster uh, in the middle, it says Chicago Day, October 9th, 1893, anniversary of the fire. Uh, the uh, female figure on the left upper edge of the uh, poster uh, is the symbol of, of uh, the uh, fair. Uh, the population uh, uh, had grown uh, to 503 by 1880. Uh, remember, it was around uh, just over 300,000 uh, in 1871, and uh, had grown to over 1 million by 1890. Remember, William Bross, the co owner of the uh, Tribune, had said that uh, uh, send your uh, men to Chicago because. Its population will be 1 million by 1900. So he was wrong by 10 years. This is a stone bust in the uh, Chicago History Museum to show uh, the symbol of the uh, uh, Columbian Exposition, a female figure with a phoenix arising from her crown with the uh, term, I will on the breastplate, evoking the determination of the city of Chicago. Well, let's get together again virtually next month. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay connected. And I wish everyone a, a, a very happy Thanksgiving.